Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So I-V-D-I. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash inv, and we'll get you the information that you need. I've noticed that you do a lot of envelope flaps, and I saw one in a case during canine extraction. I assume that the gingiva reattaches to the teeth that are not extracted. How long does it take to reattach? So what Aaron's referring to is the maxillary and mandibular canine extraction where we go into the gingiva adjacent to the tooth at the sulcus. So we take that scalpel, go back in the pocket or the sulcus of the tooth and start our flap there without making an incision. And then once we finish the extraction of the canine, then that is sutured between the teeth, opposing the attached gingiva back to the bone. And Aaron, to answer your question, it literally takes days for that to reattach. And there's no chance or the only chance of that not reattaching is if the patient gets to the surgical site. And in that case, you're going to get dehiscence. And if that happens, it's probably because of too much tension on the flap or it's because the patient got to it. So we like to have a cone, Elizabethan collar on all of the extractions that we do, especially rostral extra extractions, especially canines, and that prevents any possibility that will be a problem. So great question, Aaron. Thanks for that. Kristen has a question. What is the risk of iatrogenic jaw fracture during extraction in the canine patient? And that, that's a great question. And let me go to the keynote and I'll show you what we're talking about. And I'll describe it for our podcast listeners. So when we have a lucency adjacent to the apex of the tooth, then oftentimes that lucency is like you see in this image where describing this, the roots of the canine tooth are not really that close at all to the ventral cortex of the mandible. And it would take a tremendous lucency to extend to that point with the roots that far away from the ventral cortex. And even then, sometimes there's enough bone stability there that it's not going to be a problem. In this case, let's say it does extend to the cortex. You've got a lucency around the mesial root. It's not that big, but it's pretty dense. It extends to the cortex and breaks through the cortex somewhere. But there's no bone loss down to that. And the reason why that tooth has the lucency is because it was compromised endodontically or either through open fracture or through trauma and chronic pulpitis. And with that lucency and with those tooth roots being that far away and no bone loss, there's almost no chance of fracture that mandible if you know how to do the correct technique. So... That's the answer to that question from that standpoint. But if there's bone loss that surrounds that entire two-root structure there 
from the standpoint of the way to the apex. And those root apices are closer to the ventral cortex of the mandible, which happens in small dogs, right? This, this case that we're describing is probably a medium sized dog. So the roots aren't all the way down to the ventral cortex, but in small dogs, the tooth roots and the crown are too big. Hence the problem with crowding of the crowns and periodontal disease with smaller dogs and the fact that those teeth are too big for their mouths. And so with that, we often get bone loss that's significant starting at the marginal bone level where the periodontal disease is working its way down, killing the tooth, then producing periapical lucencies and or migrating down that bone or that tooth root bone interface, destroying the bone. So that tooth might even be a little bit mobile then that becomes an issue sometimes with fracture if the proper technique's not used. So many of our students that even come to our wet labs are apprehensive and rightfully so about extracting that tooth in particular if there's a lot of bone loss and possibly that tooth in particular even if there's no bone loss as it's perceived as a difficult extraction. In reality, it's not that difficult. And if you have the proper training and we provide that with our wet labs, we've got those coming up in June. You can find those at veterinarydentistry.net. Uh, just look at my name down there and you'll see the link. You can register for the, the course in Atlanta at our new teaching center, brand new. We've only used it twice and it's incredible in, in north of Atlanta and Sandy Springs. So I would love to see you guys there. But anyway. Again, that's one of those tangents I did off, off. But with that being said, that tooth and the mandibular canine are the ones that fracture jaw structure most often during extractions with situations where the practitioner may not be that comfortable with the extractions. And so those are often referred. And if you're not comfortable with that, I would recommend that, that you refer as well. But if you're comfortable, a uh, perfectly good technique that you've taught, that you've been taught then certainly fine to do that. So that, that hopefully that answers your question. That's a long answer, Christian, Kristen, but that's the answer to that, to that question. Sue Bullman is the Denton trail mentioned made with the Explorer. And yes, it, indeed it is the dental Explorer, which is on the other side, usually of your periodontal probe. That's that is what's the term is scored. In millimeters, generally, uh, to let you measure periodontal pockets and attachment loss with gingival recession and both are both combined. And is it done in the awake patient? No, it's done in the patient under anesthesia. You could possibly do it in the awake patient if you have a super good awake patient. But if that patient's head moves, that's a super sharp point. Therein lies the problem. So I would suggest that in all cases, with few exceptions that you do it under general anesthesia. It's got to be evaluated anyway. And your radiographs are super important if there is something that is associated with an abrasion of a tooth. And so that determination, you need radiographs anyway because that tooth has been traumatized. So do it under anesthesia, Sue, so would be the best way to, to answer that. Haley Erola. Haley, thanks for your question. Chevron affects something that affects more breeds than others. Is it common to see more on the maxillary or the mandibular teeth? And we generally see that in several places. One is the four central maxillary incisors, real common. The canine teeth, especially the maxillary canine, has a chevron effect, or it may have an effect from superimposition of the nasal cavity over the apex, which may look like a huge chevron effect or a huge lucency so you have to be really discerning in order to make that call on the maxillary canines mandibular canines may have some of that but usually not those if you see a lucency you want to look at the other side on those for sure on the apex of the mandibular canines and then the other place that you'll see those is the mandibular first and second molar more common in the mandibular first molar i think than most teeth you always want to compare that to the other side as well and make sure that your views are both parallel, which is a little easier to do. If you're comparing canine to canine in the maxilla, 
a little bit more difficult because you have to have the same, pretty much the same angle of the tube head in order to compare really accurately, but you'll get a general idea. And if there's any question, then either can have a, somebody consult with you on that radiograph after the patient wakes up. You don't want to assume that it's an extraction unless you know for sure. Certainly training in radiographic interpretation will help. We've got an online course for that at that URL that I mentioned before, five hours of just radiographic interpretation. So those things and the experience will help you make those determinations on that. So thanks, Haley, for that, for that question. So let's go down to next question. Michelle Pang, dental composites recommended to restore defects, seal dentinal tubules, and protect the underlying tooth structure. How long does it last, assuming normal everyday mastication? So if you have composite on there, excuse me, and you have a bonding agent under there, which is definitely what you want to do, the dentin bonds to that in the connective tissue of the dentin in the tubules and in the matrix. And that's pretty much a permanent thing. Uh, the composite could get knocked off, certainly. And so if you're using composite, which very few people listening today are, there are not very many people who are using composite. They might be bonding, but we teach that in the advanced course. So if you're not doing, that's where you get that information. But if you are looking to how long it lasts, if you're just bonding a minor defect in the dentin, that's going to last until tertiary dentin comes in and replaces that, or it's essentially forever. You want to monitor that tooth because if you've got that insult into dentin and you're looking at it day one, let's say it comes in Monday, you don't know when that occurred. So it might have occurred two months ago and we haven't had chances for the bacteria to get into that dentin, kill the pulp and show radiographic changes as a, as a subsequent result. You always want to check that down the road a couple months after that and make sure that you're up to, up to actually six months after that or so to make sure that there's no changes. If the patient's older, you probably want to go a year because the canal is smaller and the changes are much more slowly to develop. So those are the guidelines that you can use for that. And mastication is not going to alter that for the most part. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash INV.